Hi, I'm Diane Mitchell Prey, and today I'm going to teach you about the Pes Cavus foot morphology and recommendations for orthotic therapy. In order to do this, first I will define the cavus foot type, and then I will review the biomechanical problems this foot type offers. Next, we will review the mechanical etiology, and then review what the literature says, and finally close with orthotic considerations. My overall goal of this lecture is to provide you with valuable information that can be applied right away in your practice. So with that, let's get started. How do we define the cavus foot type? Well, it's defined in many ways, but one of these ways is a calcaneal inclination angle greater than 30 degrees on a lateral weight-bearing radiograph. Okay, so you've got a large calcaneal inclination angle. Well, what's the problem with this? Well, it's painful, and let's review why. The rigid cavus foot type is a poor shock absorber, which results in a painful gait. The high stress due to these rigid feet creates heel and metatarsal head pains and seismoiditis. Also, arch strain and pain, and muscle imbalances, which can result in hammer toes, which can also offer pain. As the arch rises in a cavus presentation, the heel will invert and create lateral ankle instability and pain associated with inversion ankle sprains or perineal tendonitis. And finally, these feet are also difficult to fit in shoes due to their prominent dorsal midfoot. So where did this rigid, high-arched, laterally unstable foot come from? In other words, what is the mechanical etiology of this cavus foot type? In reviewing the mechanical etiology of the cavus foot morphology, I would ask you to consider the biomechanical similarities between the adult acquired flat foot and the cavus foot. Years ago, we didn't recognize posterior tibial tendon dysfunction as the cause of adult acquired flat foot because we did not test the muscle strength. So if today we tested the muscle strength of the anterior tibial muscle, could we better classify, stage, and treat the cavus foot? So let's call it the same pathology, just some different muscles involved. The patient prone for the cavus foot is born with a weak anterior tibial muscle. The antagonist to this muscle is not the posterior tibial muscle, but instead the peroneus longus. So the otherwise strong and unopposed peroneus longus inserts at the first metatarsal base and plantar flexes it. This will invert in the heel and raise the arch, which results in the talus being tilted backwards into the ankle mortise and bottoming out the available ankle joint dorsiflexion range of motion, leaving the patient with a equinus deformity or a gastroxoleal contracture. Finally, what compensates for this? Well, the extensor digitorum tendon does, which results in extensor substitution, which exposes the metatarsal heads and results in increased stress to the metatarsal heads. And the forefoot during gait and your painful cavus foot. So now we've got a definition We know biomechanical problems and a mechanical etiology for the Pes cavus foot morphology. So what does the literature say? I picked four papers to review with you. This first 1998 article looked at the relationship between foot pressure pattern and foot type. They wanted to determine if foot type and location of calluses were related to the area of peak pressure in the forefoot. And they found callus location I'm sorry, calluses located at the peak pressure location in over 70% of feet. This could be very valuable information in orthotic prescription writing in our neuropathic patients where we need to offload areas in ulcer prevention. This next 2005 article looked at the effect of the Pes cavus foot on foot pain and plantar pressure for normal feet idiopathic cavus feet and neurogenic cavus feet and they found that cavus feet re reported 66 percent pain versus normal feet only reporting 23 percent of pain confirming that these are pathologic
painful feet. This next 2008 article by the same authors as this prior study wanted to evaluate Pez cavus and the relationship between pressure and pain location using in-shoe pressure sensors. They found that forefoot and rear foot pressures are greater than midfoot pressures in cavus feet irrespective of pain location. Additionally, they found cavus feet have lower pressure data suggesting, suggesting either more cautious walking or shorter stride or more pain. So these patients were walking more gingerly. Finally, this final 2006 article by the same authors as these last two studies was a prospective, randomized, single-blinded, sham-controlled study to find effective orthotic therapy for cavus feet. Their primary outcome was pain and function. They had foot pain scores that improved by 74% and function improved by 40, 45% with molded devices. Plantar pressure loading decreased with custom devices to the entire foot, or 26%, and individually decreased to the entire rear foot and forefoot, while midfoot pressure increased with a molded device, likely because the orthotic brought the ground up to the high arch to better redistribute plantar pressure. So now we know that functional foot orthotics can potentially help these rigid cavus feet. Orthotic devices can decrease pain and increase function by redistributing plantar pressure, adding shock absorption, and even adding some stability. So what can we do to an orthotic to manage these patients based on their complaints, their pains, or their limitations specifically. What can I teach you today to apply right away in your office to help your patients? We know the problems that the cavus foot offers. Here they are. Let's review them one at a time with orthotic recommendations. How do we decrease pressures in gait? Well, the rigid hind foot and the equinus in combination with extensor substitution exposing the metatarsal heads, leaving patients in pain to the forefoot, can be managed in, man in multiple ways. For heel stress, you can simply pad the heel cup of the orthotic or place a top cover on top of your orthotic for padding. This will not only pad the heel, but also the metatarsal heads, which are under stress in this foot type. If additional padding is needed on the forefoot, you can reinforce the forefoot with poron or EVA under the top cover. You can even decrease forefoot pressures by using a metatarsal bar or a metatarsal cookie. Additionally, your orthotic prescription can specifically have the lab add minimum arch fill, as this will make the orthotics contour the bottom of the foot like a glove to more effectively redistribute plantar pressures into the midfoot. If the patient is suffering from sesamoiditis, from a plantar flexed first metatarsal, a reverse Morton extension or a forefoot valgus wedge can be added to reduce plantar pressure. Here are some examples of these adjustments. The metatarsal bar, the metatarsal cookie, the padded heel, the forefoot valgus wedge using EVA versus a reverse Morton extension using Corex. And we've got poron up here patting the whole ball of the foot. How do we address arch pain? The cavus foot morphology creates high tension through the arch resulting in pain. So when prescribing orthotics, order minimum arch fill to bring the ground fully up into the arch and reduce this tension and pain. Just be sure to warn patients though that this might create arch irritation during the break-in period and be ready to adjust and troubleshoot these orthotics if patients can't handle this correction. 
I personally think this is much better than asking for standard fill and allowing some of the residual tension to remain in the arch and continue to potentially create pain. You might also need to consider ordering a plantar fascia groove as many cavus feet have prominent plantar fascia bands. How do we address the lateral ankle instability from the rigidly plantar flexed first metatarsal and inverted heel? Well, these can be managed with several options. First, when ordering your orthotic device, you can have the lab not bevel the lateral side of the rear foot post. This will add a pronatory torque to the hind foot of the orthotic. If additional correction is needed, you could add a reverse Morton extension or a forefoot valgus wedge, or you could valgus wedge the entire length of the orthotic. This will all add pronatory torque to that laterally unstable foot. Finally, how is equinus addressed, resulting from the talus being tipped backward into the ankle mortise and bottoming out the available ankle joint dorsiflexion with a heel lift? This can be attached to the rear foot post or unattached beneath the orthotic. I generally start my patients with a quarter inch cork lift not attached to the orthotic. And these are pictures here of one of my patient's orthotics with a separate lift. And this is another direct milled orthotic with an integrated cork heel lift. So now that we've defined the cavus foot type, reviewed the biomechanical problems it offers and the mechanical etiology, and went on to review the literature Let's write a complete orthotic prescription for a patient with a cavus foot. I prefer a semi-rigid vacuum formed polypropylene shell with the thickness based on the patient's body weight. I order a wide orthotic with a deep heel cup and minimum arch fill as this will all add more stability and contact for better control. Next, I order a flat EVA rear foot post with no lateral beveling to control the lateral ankle instability and a top cover to the toes for padding. Additional considerations on a per patient basis would be a plantar fascia groove or a four foot extension using just simple pour on for padding to all the metatarsal heads or a four foot valgus wedge versus reverse Morton extension, which I generally use either high density EVA or cork. I start with three millimeters thick corex for my reverse Morton extension as an example. We reviewed a lot today regarding the Pes Cavus foot morphology and I hope I shared some tools to better manage these feet in your office with functional foot orthotics. Thank you.